She usually looks at me when she's done, but so I was waiting for her to look at me. Thank you, Kathy. Um, for those of you that are here in the building this morning, for those of you joining us online, it is good to be together this morning to, uh, to, to come before our Lord, to praise Him, to worship Him. And Kathy, you are instrumental in leading us in that process, so thank you, Kathy. A uh, couple of things that you need to know this morning. We are going to do communion this morning here in uh, the church, in the, in the building. Uh, if you are joining us online, I invite you to have elements of bread and cup ready at home. Uh, here, um, we will ask you again to come forward. We've tried to improve our system a little bit here to make it a little easier for you. Christine and I will be up here. If you just come to either one of us, we can serve you. If you would like grape juice, just ask and we will serve you grape juice. Um, let me think. Anything else I need to say about that? No. All right. Um, I, don't, um, I don't mention people's birthdays unless you're here, but we have a special one in our congregation and she's not here because she can't be. Uh, Selma Voigt, a birthday today. Anybody know how old she is? 101. 101. Unbelievable. And she could probably still outwork me. So, um, it, so if you think of it, give her a call, give her a, give her, send her something and say happy birthday. We come together to worship. To do that, we want to make sure that we are in the presence of our Lord. Will you join me? And the call to worship is found in the bulletin as we read responsively. Let God's praise be heard in the midst of the congregation. Shout praise to the Lord of hosts. Let God's praise be whispered in the spirits of the people. We give you thanks for the ways you love and guide us. Let God's praise be proclaimed wherever we are. May we praise God in all we do and say. Amen. We sing praise to the Lord the Almighty. Hymn number 77, as Kathy leads us, I invite you to rise if you so desire.
Will you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, we come before you and we ask that you would open our ears, that we could hear from you, that you would open our eyes, that we could see what you do around us. But most importantly, this morning, you would open our hearts and our souls, that we would be challenged and changed by you. We ask this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. You may be seated. As our prayer of confession this morning, we are going to, um, I'm going to read a statement, you're going to respond back. So you will read the bold parts, and we will share this together. Eternal God, before you nations rise and fall, help us to choose your way. Heavenly Father, renew this nation. Give us a glimpse of the kingdom you are bringing to earth, where death violence and hunger will be no more, where all nations gather in the light of your presence. Heavenly Father, renew this nation. Teach us peace, that we may learn to walk across old borders or old boundaries as brothers and sisters in your love. Heavenly Father, renew this nation. Draw us together as one people who do your will so we might be a light to our nation leading the way to your promised kingdom heavenly father renew this nation great god let's do this part together okay a great god eternal lord show us there is no law or liberty apart from you and let us serve you wholeheartedly as your devoted followers through Christ our Lord. Amen. As Kathy and I were talking this morning, there's one Sunday a year, really, where we get to do some really cool songs. And today is one of them. And today is that day. My country, tis of thee, you know, I sang that all the time in grade school. I don't know. Do they still sing it in grade school? Wow. I got my, my grandson saying no. Of course, that's my grandson, so who knows. Him. We join together and we sing, My country tis of thee. Kathy, would you lead us? Let rocks their silence break 
There's a line in that song that says, let rocks their silence break. The rocks on this planet crumbled and shouted twice. When Jesus entered this earth in the form of a baby and when he died on a cross, and those rocks will shout again when he comes back. Amen? It's funny what goes through your head when you're singing a song, isn't it? The psalm writer. The psalm writer wrote these words from Psalm 33. The Lord foils the plans of the nations. He thwarts the purposes of the peoples. But the plans of the Lord stand firm forever the purposes of his heart throughout all, through all generations. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people he chose for his inheritance. And then we jump down to verse 18. But the eyes of the Lord are on those who fear him, on those who ho whose hope is in his unfailing love, to deliver them from death and keep them alive in famine. We wait in hope for the Lord. He is our hope and our shield. In him our hearts rejoice, for we trust in his holy name. May your unfailing love be with us, Lord, even as we put our hope in you. Catherine Bates wrote incredibly beautiful words. And I believe she had some of that ringing in her head as she wrote these words. Kathy, would you lead us in America, the beautiful... You know what? If you want to, stand. If you don't want to, don't. But um, Kathy, would you lead us? Spacious skies for amber waves are. 
God's people said amen. Amen. Will you turn and greet each other in the name of Jesus Christ this morning? Oh, and when you're ready, you can be seated. I don't know. I want you to imagine something with me. I want you to imagine you turned on the television and you were watching the news. And you heard the, 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 the following three stories on the news. The first story was this. That the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court had just issued this statement. Divine providence, that's God, has given to our people the choice of their rulers and it is the duty of our Christian nation to select and prefer Christians for their rulers. And then second, you heard this on the news. Inquiries by our reporters reveal that almost every state legislature has now passed a law requiring all elected officials to take this oath. I do profess faith in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ, his only Son, and I do acknowledge the holy scriptures of the Old and New Testaments to be given by divine inspiration. And then, then you heard this on the news. Legislation was passed today in Congress to affirm that the Congress of the United States approves of and recommends the Holy Bible for use in the schools. So what do you think would be the response? <laughs> well, I see one person back there going, yeah. <laughs> Think about the media. What would happen? Their, I, I literally, their brains would explode bigger than the fireworks did last night, okay? A total off their rocker, 
just blow a gasket, right? The amazing thing is, every one of those statements has already taken place, has already happened. It was John Jay, the uh, first Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, oftentimes called the father of the Supreme Court, and one of the primary writers of the Constitution who wrote, it is the duty of our Christian nation to select and prefer Christians for their rulers. It was the state of Delaware, along with almost every other state, which required office holders to take an oath affirming their Christian faith before they could take office. And not only did Congress in 1782 approve the use of the Bible in our schools, they even paid for them with tax dollars. And in 1844, when someone sued to have the Bibles removed from school, the Supreme Court ruled, why should not the Bible, and especially the New Testament, be read and taught as a divine revelation to the schools? Where can the purest principles of morality be learned so clearly or so perfectly as from the New Testament? I want you to think about something this morning. If these people who were so instrumental in the founding and the establishing of our nation, if they were here today to do and say the things they did, they would be considered right-wing radicals and a threat to our nation. We've strayed a long way from our roots as Americans. Now, I have to be honest with you. I struggled with which direction to go today. And um, I went back and forth, and I tried several different options, and I spent a lot of time praying. And, and, it, it, and you need to know that I'm going to do something today I have never done before. Because essentially you're going to hear a sermon that you heard five years ago. I told Dana, if I didn't tell you, you probably wouldn't know. But recent events in our nation need to be addressed. And what finally convinced me to, to bring this sermon out and use it again is I was reminded that people don't know this stuff. And if they don't hear it in church, where are they going to hear it? Because our public schools, our public and private colleges and universities have become so secularized, so distanced from God, that huge chunks of factual history, information about the spiritual roots of this country are neglected, they're not mentioned, and they're not taught. So unless you hear it from church, where are you going to hear it? There are some truths about this country and about the roots of our country and about what's right with America. And the first of those is America was settled by people looking for religious freedom. The earliest settlers of America were people who came from for primarily looking for religious freedom. Other nations, for the most part, have come out of, uh, gotten their existence out of conquest, selfish, ambitious kinds of motives. But it was primarily on the atmosphere of God, not gold, that America was born. Those who sailed on the Mayflower 
1620, fled from tyranny and oppression. You know, I heard that they don't even teach about the pilgrims anymore in some settings. But these people came, and before they even landed on the shore, while they were still on the boat, before they went ashore, they, um, in the Mayflower Compact, which they all signed, they proclaimed that they had come to the new world for the glory of God and the advancement of the Christian faith. In the early colonies, the first building to be erected was always, guess what? A church. And the first meeting that they held together as a community, guess what? Was a worship service. When sorrow came, they gathered at the church to appeal to God for help. When the harvest came in and it filled their barns, they gathered at the church to give God thanks. Then in 1643, as more and more people arrived on these shores, they joined, they joined together to form the New England Confederation they wrote a constitution which was actually the first constitution written in the New World. And it began with these words. Whereas we all came into these parts with one and the same end and aim, namely to advance the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ and to enjoy the liberties of the gospel in purity and peace. Friends, these are our spiritual forefathers who came to the shores of America so they could worship and practice their faith without fear of persecution. The earliest settlers came here primarily looking for religious freedom. And I read this morning that a state in this union has banned singing in churches. And there are still churches in this country, in states, that are not allowing them to meet. Let that sink in. I promised I wasn't going to get political. <laughs> but let it sink in. Do you think those early settlers would have uh, not gone to church because some governor said don't go? No, in fact, they, <laughs> they would have run him out of town on a rail. The second thing right about America is our founders had a strong desire to be pleasing to God and to do his will. Now you need to remember that around 150 years passed from the time of the earliest settlers to the beginning of our nation. And quite frankly, a lot of things happened in those 150 years that are not things that we're super proud of. Because you see, as time passed, and those originalers, originaler, there we go, original settlers died off, many of their descendants were more concerned with increasing their wealth and living a comfortable life than in being faithful to God and His Word. And as more immigrants arrived, many of them came for other reasons and with entirely different motives than those earliest settlers. For example, England came up with a strategy to empty their prisons by allowing prisoners to come to the new world as indentured service, servants. And then at the same time, the king of England was giving out huge tracts of land to his buddies. And slavery was introduced by those people into the new world to work those vast tracts of land. And the spiritual atmosphere deteriorated rapidly. Churches were dying. Many who had once 
sought religious freedom for themselves were being intolerant of others. And it was during this time that some went off into really strange spiritual directions and we get things like the Mormons and the Jehovah's Witnesses and others. The end result of all of this was by 1730, only about 10% of the people in the colonies attended church at all. What had, begun, what had begun for the glory of God and the advancement of the Christian faith had almost disappeared from our land. And what you need to know is much of the negative stuff that we hear about the early history of our nation comes out of this period that I've just described for you. Those who oppose Christianity today love to point out things in that time period that were going on that were not good. But what they conveniently ignore to tell you, or ignore to tell you about, is what happened in 1734. Because you see, in 1734, a handful of preachers... Jonathan Edwards, George Whitefield, John Wesley, several others. They began to preach in their churches. And then they left their churches and they went out into the streets. And then they left the streets and went out into the fields. And their CERN, the, the, these preachings uh, soon turned into crusades and revivals that spread throughout the 13 colonies. There were so many people coming to Christ through, uh, through, uh, these, uh, yeah, during these years that those years became known as the Great Awakening. Tens of thousands dedicated their lives to Jesus Christ and were baptized. Benjamin Franklin, a name most of you know, he wrote this. It was wonderful to see the change soon made in the manners of our inhabitants. From being thoughtless or indifferent about religion, it seemed as if all the world were growing religious, so that one could not walk through the town in an evening without hearing psalms sung in different families of every street. Wouldn't it be cool to walk down the street and hear nothing but psalms being sung? That's what was happening. In fact, Benjamin Franklin was so impressed with George Whitefield and his preaching that he helped him build an auditorium to accommodate the crowds of up to 30,000 people that were coming to hear Whitefield preach. Now what you need to know is that that was happening in the city of Philadelphia that at the time only had a population of 25,000. The entire city. And everywhere beyond the city they were coming to hear these preachers. And it wasn't just in Philadelphia. It was all throughout the 13 colonies. Openly devout Christians were no longer just 10% of the population. They were quickly over 50% of the population. So why am I telling you this? I'm telling you this because the Great Awakening laid the groundwork for the American Revolution. Our founding fathers, the signers of the Declaration of Independence, those who wrote the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, those who put their lives on the line, who fought and died that we might be free, all of them grew up, came into leadership while this great awakening was taking place. Their generation the generation that experienced the Great Awakening became the leaders of the American Revolution. And the American Revolution did not rise out of rebellion. 
The American Revolution rose out of a movement of the Spirit of God. Don't believe me? Check out this prayer from George Washington. It comes from his diary. In his diary, it's in his own handwriting. It goes like this. Let my heart, gracious God, be so affected with your glory and majesty that I may discharge those weighty duties which thou requirest of me. Again, I have called on thee for pardon and forgiveness of sins, for the sacrifice of Jesus Christ offered on the cross for me. Thou gavest thy Son to die for me, and has given me assurance of my salvation. Does that sound like a man who is born again and going to heaven? I don't care what you've heard. I don't care what you've been told. George Washington was George Washington was a devout Christian. And he wasn't alone in his faith. Over a 10-year period, political science professors at the University of Houston, clearly not a Christian place, okay? collected and cataloged 15,000 writings by the Founding Fathers. Their goal was to determine the primary source of ideas behind the Constitution by identifying the source quoted most often by them. Maybe we want to take a shot at what the source was? The Bible. 94% of the quotes of the founders of our nation were based on the Bible. The cultural environment on the eve of the American Revolution was undeniably spiritual. And this focus dramatically affected the men and women who gave birth to this nation. There's a third truth that I want to tell you about this morning that's right with America. America was founded by men and women who acknowledged God's supreme rule over people and nations. Well, they weren't perfect. They weren't all devout, sold out, 100% Christians, but they all, every one of them, acknowledged God as the supreme ruler over people and over nations. If it's been a while, some of you need to read the Declaration of Independence. Most of you are familiar with the prologue. It says, We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their government? No. They're endowed by other men? No. They're endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. They were saying, we want a form of government whose job it is to protect what the Creator has already given us. Then they list a series of charges that they had against the King of England, and they make a couple more references to God. It says, we, therefore, the representatives of the United States of America in general Congress assembled, listen to this, appealing to the supreme judge of the world. And supreme judge is capitalized as a proper name. They were saying God is the supreme judge of the world. And then they end their declaration with these words. And for the support of this declaration with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, that's God, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, 
and our sacred honor. I've, I've, seen, I've seen a painting of the First Continental Congress. Many of you have as well. Many of you have heard the story of how they were discussing and debating the Declaration of Independence and, and they weren't getting very far. And finally, one of them suggested they all get on their knees and ask God what should be done. And these framers of the Declaration of Independence, all, every one of them, went to their knees and as one began to pray and seek the wisdom and guidance of God. Wouldn't it be wonderful if our president, our Congress, our Supreme Court today would get down on their knees, not in protest, but like our forefathers did, and ask God, what do you want for this nation? At the signing of the Declaration of Independence, Samuel Adams, yes, he was a real person and he didn't make beer, often referred to as the father of the revolution, actually, he declared, we have this day restored the sovereign to whom all men ought to be obedient. He reigns in heaven, and from the rising to the setting of the sun, let his kingdom come. There's a lot more that I could share about the Christian roots and foundations of our nation. There is not time on a Sunday morning to cover it all. But I want to ask you this. Do you know what the tallest structure in Washington, D.C. is? Washington Monument. And by law, nothing taller than the Washington Monument can be built in Washington, D.C. And do you know what's inscribed at the top of the Washington Monument? the very top, these words in Latin from Scripture, let God be praised. Don't feel bad if you didn't know that. I am uh, really certain. <laughs> I don't bet, but I'm really certain there are legislators, representatives and senators in this country who don't know. I believe there have been presidents who don't know that's up there. There have been Supreme Court justices that don't know that's up there. But at the very top, at the pinnacle of our nation's capital are these words, let God be praised. Why did they put that there? Because they understood what we read earlier. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. And God can't be the Lord of a nation until he is the Lord of its people. So how does that happen? Once a man asked an evangelist, how can we have revival? And the evangelist answered the guy and he said, well, do you have a place where you can go pray? And the guy said, yeah. The evangelist said, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go to that place and I want you to take a piece of chalk with you. And I want, to, I want you to get down on your knees and draw a, a circle, a complete circle, all the way around you with the chalk. And then I want you to ask God for revival to come to everything inside that circle. 
and then stay there until it does. And you will get revival. Friends, this country, this world needs revival. We need a new great awakening. But before it will happen in this country, before it will happen in the world, it has to happen to us first. And that revival begins as we remember that on the night he was betrayed, Jesus took bread and he broke it. And he said, do this in remembrance of me. And after supper, he took the cup And he said, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood poured out for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it for the remembrance of me. This is where revival begins. If you come to this table just going through the motions. Then revival won't happen in you. And if it doesn't happen in you, then it can't happen around you. You join me in prayer. Dear God, you have promised us that you are a God who transforms. You change things. You you make things different. So that, that at the touch of your grace, nothing is ever the same. God, we come before you today in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. We ask your spirit to change things here today. To make these ordinary gifts of a bread and cup into the extraordinary presence of Jesus Christ here. Body given, blood shed. We ask that you would hold us as your own. That you would renew us as your people that you would transform us with your love. Friends, the table is where revival starts. I invite you to come, leave some space between you and others, Come and start the revival that can change the world.
throughout this nation, throughout the world, God's people meet. God's people join together in one voice, lifting to him the prayer he gave us, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. In one of the first and one of the greatest tests this nation faced, in a war between the North and the South, and what stood at stake was a united nation, the United States of America. And this song came out of that test. Kathy, would you lead us as we rise together? have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. He hath loosed the fateful lightning of his terrible swift sword. His truth is marching on. Fires of a hundred circling camps They have builded him an altar in the evening dews and damps I can read his righteous sentence by the dim and flaring lamps His day is marching on He has sounded forth the trumpet that shall never call retreat. He is sifting out the hearts of men before his judgment seat. 
Oh, be swift, my soul, to answer him. Be jubilant, my feet. Our God is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. His truth is marching on. In the beauty of the lilies, Christ was born across the sea with a glory in his bosom that transfigures you and me. As he died to make men holy, let us die to make men free, while God is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. And now to the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. <laughs>